So um, it's a, with great pleasure that I introduce Professor Stephen Sabat. He's the Professor em Emeritus of Psychology at Georgetown University, where he has offered courses in clinical neuropsychology, physiological psychology, and introductory psychology. He's a three-time recipient of the Edward B. Bunn Award for Excellence in Teaching and a recipient of the College Dean's Award and College Academic Council Award for Excellence in Teaching at Georgetown. His research over the past 38 years has focused on the cognitive and social strengths and the subjective experience of people with dementia. He's the author of numerous scientific journal articles and book chapters, and the books, The Experience of Alzheimer's Disease, Life Through a Tangled Veil, Alzheimer's Disease and Dementia, What Everyone Needs to Know, and co-editor of Dementia, Mind, Meaning, and the Person. Again, all books will be listed as a on a resource list that we're gonna send out after the conference. So Stephen, I would like to turn it over to you and looking forward to this. Well, thank you very much, Kim. And thank you for inviting me to this meeting and this conference. I, the only, uh, my only wish is that uh, this could have been in person because I love Dublin and Ireland and it would have been great to be there. But being there this way is, is just terrific too. So I, I hope that what I have to say today will be informative. Um, but I probably won't be telling you a lot of that, what you don't know already. But I, what I may be doing is giving you some different ways of looking at what you know and thinking about what you already know. So if we could, so you'll see this is uh, the effects of labeling relationships. And that's really important because from a psychological standpoint and a social, social standpoint, the way we approach people and how we think about them affects how we communicate with them and what we make of their communications with us. So if we can go to the first, if you click on the first slide. So communication, and I'm, I'm just gonna go through a bunch of these things and, and, and then I'll get to some examples that will kind of uh, perhaps shine a light on some of what I'm about to say. So communication entails a relationship. And if you can click the first, uh, that you often between persons. Now I'm not trying to be droll here, because uh, many of us who have pets know that we will talk to cats or dogs or birds or whomever or whatever, and we will communicate with them and they with us. So for our purposes today, communication off is often between persons and the next, and, the rela and that relationship depends on, and we can go to the next point, the way one person views the other and the next point the social and the social relationship that ensues. And we're going to be functioning, really talking about the function of social relationships here. And the next point is, which affects what I say, how I say it, and how I interpret the other person's words. And the next point is that the labels we use for people affect the quality and depth of communication and how it is communicated. And the next point is, and this becomes very important for our purposes today. And that is professional to patient relationships are socially different and psychologically different from relationships between persons and persons. And the next slide then, a person to person relationship is not the same as a person to patient relationship. And the first point of this is that persons are patients only in relation to medical professionals. Now, a few minutes ago, um, Kim Tully introduced me and she didn't say, this is Professor Savat, he's a dental patient. Well, I am a dental patient actually, and I've been a dental patient for most of my life in relation to my dentist. But as it turns out, my main social identity is not dental patient nor what I want it to be because there's a lot more to me than being a dental patient. And the next point on this slide is people with dementia are often unfortunately referred to as dementia patients. Uh, a very well-meaning, uh, uh, actually very highly educated person at, a, at a, a meeting that I was presenting at said, introducing her husband said, this is my husband, he's the patient. But actually he was much more than a patient uh, in the same way that I'm much more than, than, than a dental patient. And let's just do a bit of a thought experiment around this idea. And the thought experiment is this. I want you to think about something about yourself that you don't like. 
uh, maybe something that you like the least about yourself. And maybe that's something that you like least about yourself is something that you have been encouraged to change, want to change, have tried to change, and for one or another reason, haven't been able to change. Now, I, I mean, if I were in front of you, looking at your faces, I would be able to see if any of you have come up with one of those things that fits that, that, that descriptor. And if there's anybody who's listening to this and watching this right now, cannot think of one thing about themselves that they don't like and have tried to change and haven't been able to change. And I would su suggest that you speak with somebody in the area of psychological counseling because you're clearly in denial. So having said all of that, and you, if you have something in mind that you don't like about yourself, you've tried to change and haven't been able to, think about how you would feel if everyone you encountered saw you principally for that one characteristic. It probably would not be the whole, the thing that you would want, because if they said, oh, and you're, you're this way or that way, you're the one who hasn't been able to quit smoking. You're the one who, well, wait a minute, you know, there's more to me than just that. I mean, that's my failing, but I, I, I've got a lot of other things that are about me that are pretty darn good. So if, given that, we want to put ourselves into the framework, the mental framework of somebody who's been diagnosed with dementia. Okay, so if we go to the next point, <clears throat> personhood is different from patienthood. Psychologically, how we think and act. Interpersonally, how we act with and toward others and how others see us. If the others are medical professionals and we're patients. Though that social relationship is entirely different. And being a patient means something very different than being a person. And if our social identity is patienthood, our personhood could be threatened. So the next point on this is that we communicate differently with patients than we do with persons. Professionals do this, individuals do this. If I'm introduced to you and you're a patient, and I don't, I'm not even a physician, but oh, this is the patient. Uh, well, now I'm going to be looking at you in a particular way that's quite different than I would if I saw you otherwise. If we can go to the next slide, Patients are, and we have a bunch of characteristics here. There's recipients of care. The next one is they're managed, treated, told what to do. I mean, that's, that's a typical, at least in the United States, it's very typical to hear physicians talk about managing the patient. So they're treated, they're told what to do. Physicians or nurses or nurse practitioners, or aides tell people what to do because you're the patient and you're in a subservient position. The next point is that you are subservient. You're in a junior social position to others. The, the medical professionals have the knowledge. You are lacking in independence and agency. You can't just do it any, anything you want when you're in a hospital. You can't pick up and go someplace. Because, oh, where are they going? You, you're attached to some line or IV. The next point is that people called dementia patients are often not viewed as being semiotic subject. And this is a really important point. A semiotic subject is a person for whom meaning is the driving force behind what they do and say. So I'll just say that again, because a semiotic subject is a person whose actions are meaning driven, driven by the meaning of the situations they're in. What the situation means to them will affect how they behave. Right now, this situation to me means I need to be informative and engaging, and that is affecting how I'm behaving right now. So a patient is often not viewed as acting from the point of view of what the meaning of a social situation is. Usually it'll turn out, if I, if I get really upset, it could be symptomatic, for example, symptomatic of illness rather than symptomatic of a dysfunctional social relationship. And the next point, is that psychologically and socially, patients are limited. An example of Christopher Reeve, the actor, late Christopher Reeve, is really telling. And he, for those of you who don't know, and there may be some, um, Christopher Reeve played the role of Superman in a number of films in the 70s and perhaps the early 80s. And he was very handsome and, and very well, physically well put together, and he was, he was very bright. And he was also an equestrian, and he had a terrible horseback riding accident that left him quadriplegic. And in the aftermath of this, and he was young, he was a parent, he's, you know, he, he had his whole life to look forward to, and 
now he's quadriplegic and and had a trach tube and he was devastated and he asked his wife to help him commit suicide and she prevailed upon him to wait and maybe after some time if he if he still feels that way she would help him so he said okay and and but what happened in the, in, the, in the time that went by is that he became an indefatigable advocate for research and raising of awareness regarding spinal cord injuries he created with his wife a foundation to support research and raising awareness testified countless times before committees in the united states congress he came in in the wheelchair and he you know and he spoke and he testified and he was incredibly active and did a lot of good and someone asked him someone who knew that he wanted to end his life in the aftermath of that accident asked him you know, you wanted to die and how is it that you could do all of this stuff well what changed you what what, what was it that that was critical and crucial rather in, in changing your view of things and and the first thing he said was i had to stop being a patient and start being a person i had to stop being a patient and start being a person so when he thought of himself as a patient he was not acting in the world taking initiative he was a, he was reacting he was doing what he had to do as a patient being a person meant taking more control of your life doing things that you and taking initiative in whatever ways you can acting according to what is fulfilling and meaningful to you and now his situation now you think about it he was physically incapable of moving around very well but he was he had no problems finding the words he wanted to use when he spoke he could speak fluently without any problem he didn't have any memory dysfunctions whatsoever he could do this stuff because he was still fluent in all of those ways people with dementia on the other hand can have great challenges in finding the words they want to use and speaking fluently and recalling the things they need to say at the moment they need to say it so people with dementia need help in the in terms of supporting their personhood and that's where thinking of yourself as a patient can be deleterious to your social identity and to your ability to do things in the world that matter so patients can be limited not just by the physical illnesses they have but by the the prison bars that are created socially from within themselves and the way others treat them. So persons, if we go to the next slide, persons, on the other hand, are, and in the next but they are givers and recipients of care. They are, or in addition, they're not subservient, but are on an equal social plane with others and could, could be either junior or senior to others as well. Another, uh, still another characteristic is they are interacted with rather than managed. Although, yes, there are people who work in factories who are whatever have, there are managers, yes, but not in the same way that physicians manage patients. And another, another point here is that they exercise independence and agency and are viewed as being semiotic subjects. The, event, the example of General Yu is a really good one. He was a retired US Army general. He, he was an Omaha Beach D-Day veteran who stayed in the army for three and a half decades after that. But he had been diagnosed with dementia and he was in a very, very good high end, at least expensive nursing home. And, and he, one morning an aide came in, awakened him from his sleep and told him that it was time to take a shower. And he didn't want to take a shower at that moment. Now, you know, usually in one's adult life, one is not told when to take showers. And usually when one is in, in one's adult life, one doesn't have someone wake him or her up to take a shower and tell you it's time to take a shower. In any event, he didn't want to do that. And the aide had a job to do. And I do understand the aide had a job to do. But the aide had the job to do. And the aide was tr tried to pull General Yu out of bed, put his hands on and tried to pull him out of bed. And General Yu fought back and hit the aide. General Yu's behavior was then characterized in his chart as combative and uncooperative. And that was told to his physician, and he was prescribed Seroquel, which is a, a, a contraindicated for people with dementia anyway, but he was given it anyhow. 
became something of a zombie, but his behavior was characterized as combative and, and uncooperative, which is the way you look at a dementia patient rather than a person who is not going to be pulled out of bed in the morning by someone he hardly knows to do something he doesn't want to do. So if he's treated as a person, he's engaged, communicated with, not assaulted. So there's a difference between being a patient and being a person in a variety of ways. And if we go to the next slide, then we can see that <clears throat> There are effective, in order to communicate effectively with persons living with dementia, we have to do a number of different things. And the first point is, we have to take the intentional stance toward that person. The intentional stance is a, a, a term that was created by a guy named Daniel Dennett, who's a philosopher. But what it means is you assume that what the person is saying and doing has a reason behind it. You assume, when you take the intentional stance towards someone, you assume that what that person is doing or saying is being done for a reason. There's some form of communication trying, being made here, and it might not be clear, but you assume that there is. That is from the get-go. That is, this is an attempt to communicate. Whatever it may be, I am, this person is doing something, and, and I don't know what it is, but I'm assuming that there's a reason for it. And the next point then follows, and that is we look for meaning in what the person says and does. Because assuming, if we assume that there's a reason for this, then we then look for the meaning behind it, even if it isn't apparently clear. There was a man at a day center and he, he I call him the top guy. He was a, a retired corporate executive who traveled around the world with his, his wife. And he's at a day center now and uh, he had been diagnosed with dementia and his wife had brought him to the, the, the day center because she couldn't uh, care for him during the day as she needed to go and take care of things for the household. In any event, I was in, uh, talking with him on a number of occasions and I tried to make some contact with him about who he was and, and what his life was about. And at the time, and given his age, I, I assumed that he might well have served in, in, in the United States military during World War II. I asked him about that. And I said, were you in the army during the war? And he said, yes. And I said, well, were you in the Air Force? And he said, yes. Now, you know, if it, it turns out that during World War II, the United States Army and the United States Air Force were not two separate services as they are now. It was called the US Army Air Force. So if I didn't know that history, I might have made a very different assumption about him saying yes to both of those services. And I said, oh, so you were in the Army Air Force, yes. What did you do? And he said, I was the top guy. Now I'm trying to, well, you were general and no, and he couldn't find the words to describe what the top guy meant. Well, I might spoke with his wife because I assumed that there was meaning behind this, that he wasn't being delusional. I asked her what he did in the military during the war and he turned out to have been the pilot of a large aircraft. So in the, in the, in the context of, of the Air Force, he was a pilot, he was the top guy. So it made perfect sense. He couldn't find the word pilot, but, so, but he was the top guy. Mrs. D was uh, a, a person who had been diagnosed with dementia some years earlier, another attendee at a day center. Her husband told me that she had a delusion about having a job. And I asked him why he thought that. He said, well, because she's always hurrying me in the morning to take her to work and she doesn't have a job. And so it turned out, I mean, I, I knew this lady and we had had many kinds of conversations back and forth. She was a very outgoing person. She had been raised in a show business family and sang old songs and told jokes and, and had people laughing and the people at the day center and the participants had them laughing. And I said to her one day, I said, hey, you've been holding out on me, you know, you, you have some kind of job. And she looked at me quizzically and I said, well, your husband told me that you, you are always on his case to take him to, to get him to take you to work in the morning. And she thought about it and she said, oh, oh. And she, then she realized she viewed what she did at the day center as her work, because she said, there are lots of people here who are really sad and depressed and, and, and I try to cheer them up. 
And in fact, the staff used to call on her to integrate new members of the, of the community into the group uh, because she was such an outgoing person. So she had a job in her mind. I mean, it wasn't paid employment, but that was her work to her. So we have to keep in mind the personality of the individual and that person's history in trying to under, un, unravel and understand what they're communicating about. And the next point is that we have to key in on the emotions being expressed. For example, and the next point is Mr. M and our first encounter at the day center. Mr. M was, uh, he was dressed really nicely and I had never met him before. I walked into the day center, said, hello, how are you? And he launched into a tirade of words. And it was, every word was coherent. It was clear, but put together, I couldn't make heads or tails out of what he was trying to tell me. I assumed he was trying to tell me something. What I noticed though, was he was really upset and agitated and there was, he was clearly unhappy, frustrated, ups, annoyed, uh, feeling terrible. And so when I finally got a word, could get a word in edgewise, I said to him, keying in on that, I said, do you feel like crying? And he stood back and he said, you're damn right I do, which was the first coherent sentence he spoke. Now this man, this man and I spent time together and he understood my intentions because I was trying to understand him. And I told him as much. And he even one day uh, pointed to, at, at me in, in one of the, the rooms at the, at the day center where some activities are going on, pointed toward me and told one of the nursing students, he always called me good friend. He could never recall my name, but he always called me good friend, God bless you, is what he always said to me. He pointed toward me and he said to the nursing student, he's trying to get in. He's trying to get in and, and I can't, but, but I, he's trying. So he understood my intention. His mini mental state scores were terrible, but he understood my intentions and, and he understood that I was with him somehow. So, the, and the next point then is this same man is sitting with me, Mr. B, who had been diagnosed with Alzheimer's type dementia, and Mrs. O, who had a right, a, a right hemisphere, no, left hemisphere, no, right hemisphere stroke, sorry, a right hemisphere stroke, and she had some paralysis in her arm on the left side of her body. Mr. M stands up and he starts talking the way he did as, as I just described to you when I first met him. Mrs. O looks and says to Mr. B and me, he's confused. Mr. B, who had dementia, said he's upset. And I said to Mr. B and Mrs. O, I said, Mr. B, I think you're correct. I think he is upset, but we don't know what he's upset about. So actually it's we who are confused. And the next point is, it's important to use something called indirect repair. Indirect repair is a way of trying to unearth what someone is saying to you if you don't quite get it or you're not sure. So in, in, in other words, if a person says something and you're not sure, you, you start by saying, I'm having trouble understanding what you're saying. So now the onus is on you. you know, I'm having trouble and I need you to help me out here. So let me see if I understand something of what you're saying. Are you saying that? And then you proceed to say what you think the person might be getting at or how the person might be feeling, which to which the person can then say yes or no. And now you have a clue or you know where to go or where not to go farther with this, further with this whole in, interaction. You, you admit you're having trouble. You never ever say, uh-huh, when you don't understand something. You think about this. I've seen this happen so many times where Someone, and this was generally in hospitals, where a person is saying things, person with dementia is saying things, and it's clear that it's not very, not very understandable to the listener who is a medical person. And that person would say, okay, uh-huh, uh-huh, okay, it's okay. And, you know, if the person is saying, you're standing on my foot and it hurts you, would you please move? That's what the person's trying to say, but it's not coming out that way. But the listener says, uh-huh, okay, and you're not moving. 
Now the person is getting upset because I just, I, I'm trying to tell you, you're standing on my foot and it hurts. And you're saying, uh-huh, okay. Well, you're not doing anything. What the hell is wrong with you? you know, so if you don't understand something, you don't say, uh-huh, because saying, uh-huh, means you do understand. So that's really bad communicative style. So using indirect repair means you're in this, you're in this game with that other person. I, I, it's my job. It's as, look, a conversation is something between people and both parties are in a contract of sort, a social contract where we are taking each to responsibility to try to help the other. And if the person with dementia is having trouble finding those words, then I, as the listener, who actually cares about this whole, this person and what he or she is trying to say to me, I have to take some responsibility in unearthing that. And it really is very interesting because when you do that, that person understands your intention. And so using indirect repair, are you trying to tell me that? Let me see if I understand. Are you saying this? It really helps because it, it, that part, it's part of a communicative process where we're going to get to the bottom of the whole idea. So if we go to the next slide, we have some other, I have some other examples for you. So another thing to do that's really important to do is to adjust your rate of speech to match that of the person with whom you're speaking. Don't outpace the person. And that's one of Tom Kitwood's great uh, examples of malignant social psychology, outpacing. So if a person is speaking slowly, you match that person's speech because that person's ability to process information might be somewhat compromised. And so you have to slow it down, take some time. And we're not real good at taking time, are we? I mean, you think about it, you know, the moments of silence. Oh my gosh. You know, if a person, if a person with dementia is speaking and is having problems finding the words that he or she wants to use, and 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 there are pauses, you have to be able to sit there and tolerate the pause. Because it might take uh, a little longer for um, me to, to get, uh, to get the, um, um, what I want to tell you. We're not good at tolerating pauses. I mean, socially, it's just unbelievable. You know, you, you're in a situation where the person is silent. Silence. Oh my God, the silence. This is terrible. So we have to be able to adjust our rate of speech to match that of our interlocutor. It really does help. And so doing all of these things puts us into the same arena together. And it's really important for there to be a together when we're trying to communicate with anybody, not just some people living with dementia. And another point here is, the, ne the next point is, be aware of the person's nonverbal facial expressions that could, could indicate not being clear about what you're saying. Now, this was a situation that arose with Mr. B I was telling you about earlier. And he was a, he was a really interesting man. He, had a, a young onset dementia. So he was about 57 years old. And uh, when he was at the day center, he had, he had been a, a beloved teacher, a high school teacher. And uh, when I met him, I, I made some contact with him because I was a teacher too. And we talked about it and I, he, I told him I was from New York originally. And, um, and he actually made a memory of that because in our first encounters, because um, I had gone out of town for a Christmas uh, break in classes. And I wasn't at the day center where I would be a few times every week. And he, during my absence said to the director of the day center, actually, and you have to watch this because it's really important. He talking about me asked, didn't say where's Professor Sabat or anything like that. He just said, 
where's where's the guy from New York? You know, and he didn't have a beard, by the way, or a mustache. So he recalled I was from New York and that I had a beard. Anyway, we got on well together just because I was interested in being with him and, and, and learning from him. And I would, on occasion, when he needed to go to the restroom, I would take him there. And so he went into, one day he went into the stall to urinate. And so he finished and he was zipping up his zipper and he was coming out of the stall and he hadn't flushed the toilet. And I said to him, Mr. B, could you do me a favor? And he looked at me, yeah. I said, could you flush the toilet, please? And the expression on his face was, was blank. I mean, it usually wasn't, but it was just, I said, could you please flush the toilet for me? Again, it's totally blank. I mean, he's standing right, I mean, standing, you know, he's standing right in the entrance way. You, you, if you, all he had to do was turn his head and he'd see the toilet. So I said to him, and I pointed, so I made his eyes go that way where the toilet was. I said, you see that silver thing sticking out over there? Yeah. I said, Could you push it down for me, please? And he walked over, pushed it down. So two things happening there. I mean, I'm reading his facial expression, trying again to maybe he didn't hear me correctly, what have you. Okay, he's not understanding flush the toilet. Now, what do I have to do to get him to do that? So that, that's part of the experiment, right? I mean, it, it's, it's a, I'm not going to go over there and do it because I, I, I'm interested in knowing what I have to say to him that will get him to accomplish the same task, but not using the same words, obviously. I mean, because that's just not going anywhere because I see when I use those words, he has a blank expression on his face. So read the facial expressions, figure out what is important in, in this communicative act. How do I rephrase what I'm saying? Speak at a pace that the person can match. Okay, and the next point is, and adjust what you say so as to convey your message, as, as with Mr. B in that previous example, and Mrs. K at the day center. Now she was, again, a person with living with dementia who had been a very service-oriented person in her life. And, and was always doing volunteer work and, and loved helping people. And she did that at the day center. And in fact, you know, she would, if somebody was in a wheelchair and, and wheeled him or herself over to, a, to go into the hallway and the door was closed, she would be the one who would notice this from across the room and walk over and, and motion to the door. And she would be the one that would open, who would open the door she would be the one to, to try to help other people, I mean, even, even me. So one day uh, was, they were getting ready to, for the lunch meal. And I said to her, would, would you help, please help me set the tables? And again, she had this very blank look on her face and set the table, which is not something that's unusual, but nonetheless, she, I was reading that facial expression. And so what I did was I took a tape, a place setting, and I put it down on the table in front of a seat. And I looked at her and I pointed that and I said, could you do this all around the table to where all of the seats are? Boom, she did it right away. So it's a matter of adjusting what we say and do, but to fit it into something that this person could do that we know this person can do and would love to help out doing. So all of this comes together, right? I mean, you're, you're, you, all of these different things can be used. It's not, it's not sort of some sort of cookbook, but in each situation, you can, you can measure the person's way of thinking. You can act in ways that, that are, are encouraging and facilitative. And we can go to the next slide. So underlying all of this, there are some guiding principles that I'd like to get at here. Assume that what you say and do will be memorable to your partner in conversation. Assume that because if you're helpful and if you are engaging, it will be memorable. Just as the man always called me, good friend, God bless you. He couldn't, he didn't know my name or he, he couldn't recall my name, but he knew something about me 
because of the way I engaged him and the way I behaved with him, he knew enough about me and made a memory. So as always to say, call me good friend and God bless you. He didn't say that to everybody else there. In fact, he didn't say it to anybody else there. So at the day center. So assume that what you say and do will be memorable. It could be memorable in a good way and it can be memorable in a bad way, but just assume that it'll be memorable. And the next point is, another, another principle is, remember that people living with dementia possess self-respect and seek to avoid embarrassment and humiliation. The ability to, 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 to retain the sense of self-respect and to avoid embarrassment and humiliation is not something that is measured by any standard neuropsychological test. No cognitive test, nothing, none of that. None of those tests get at this characteristic. And avoiding it, Mrs. K, for example, whom I help, who helped me set the table, Mrs. K had really bad word finding problems. She rarely spoke. And there were times when there would be a small group discussion going on, small group discussion, she couldn't do it. She would get up and she would go for a walk in the hall. She wouldn't sit there and have somebody, you know, the, the leader say, and what do you think? She's lost. She cannot find words and she would not sit there. Another thing about her was that she always looked great in terms of her clothing and the makeup on her face, which she brought with her to the day center, by the way, and, and did it even better than her husband. Her husband tried to do it, but he didn't do a good job. But in any event, seeking to avoid embarrassment and possessing self-respect are there, and you have to assume that. The next point is, just as they did, people living with dementia possess self-respect and seek to avoid embarrassment, just as they did during the balance of their lives, and just as you and I do, and deserve to be treated accordingly as persons because by honoring their personhood, we also honor our own. And at, at, with that, I, I would like to thank you for your attention to all and to you especially, but to staff and participants at the Holy Cross Hospital Adult Day Center in Silver Spring, Maryland, to Georgetown University undergraduate students in clinical neuropsychology who were in all of this with me from the beginning. In fact, the staff and participants at the Holy Cross Adult Day Center were extraordinary for a period of more than 30 years, different staff people, different participants over the course of time, but they were absolutely wonderful. And so I'll, I'll end on that note. And I'm here for you to question, interrogate, pillory as you wish. <laughs> Stephen, that was lovely. I really enjoyed that. A lot of insightful things that you said. Um, if anybody has any questions for Stephen, you can put those into the Q&A. I just wanted to just, I mean, my first impression is it's just common sense, a lot of the things that you say. But how do you, how do you propose that we can show that to other people and train other people to think like that? Well, that's that's the question of the hour. I mean, that's 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 something that I've been trying to do for thirty eight years. I mean, I, I, it, what we're facing is a, a real. It is a battle of sorts, and I and I'm 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 in it. Um, I, I get it because what people hear in the mass media is mostly negative stuff and stigmatic stuff about dementia. In fact, um, I'm involved in a, in, a, in a research project right now where volunteers working with people with dementia in a, in a respite program, they admittedly said, you know, I don't have to be afraid of them anymore. Well, yes, you just got to know people, you know, you understand their strength. So what, the, what we're dealing with, the, the way we do this is by a tremendous amount of education. That's what it, people need to be educated. And then they're being educated only in terms of signs and symptoms of illness and nomenclature. And so they, that's what it is. Oh, dementia. Oh, they're crazy. 
that's what we're dealing with. And so what we have to do is say, well, wait a minute. Here's a person with dementia, and this person isn't crazy. Just listen to this. And there are, there are people like Christine Bryden or Kate Swaffer. I mean, there are people in the world who are doing this work, but we need to do this too and, and get that message out and, and start to get people to open their minds and hearts. I mean, that's the short script, but it's re-education and it's what has to, has, has to happen. Very good. Well, a question has come in. Do you have any thoughts on therapeutic lying and its place in dementia care? Oh boy, that's, yeah, here we go. We could write books on this one. In fact, people have, uh, you know, what are you lying? I mean, okay, look, let's, let's try to be reasonable here. What are you lying about? You know, uh, what, what, what's, what is the issue? You know, if a person is saying, you know, oh, look at the snow out there. And you say, no, it's not snowing. Or you say, yeah, it's snowing. I, 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 don't, I think the, the main idea here is, what, what is the lie about? I mean, it, you know, I, I need more information. I mean, that's a big question. I mean, there are some cases, to me at least, there are some cases where it like, really doesn't matter. I mean, you, say, you could say something. Here's an example of what you shouldn't lie about, OK? Here's a great, and this is a true story. Woman in a, a residential home, a care home, doesn't want, she has dementia. She doesn't want to get dressed. And she, she doesn't want to get dressed. And so the aide tells her that her son is coming to take her home for a visit. So she needs to get dressed so she can go with him. She proceeds to get dressed and then she proceeds to pack some clothing in a little suitcase and she goes to the lobby waiting for her son to come. She's sitting there and a, and, and a different aide who knew nothing about that conversation sees her sitting there and says, look, we're, we're getting ready to do in some activity. And, and the woman says, I can't, my son is coming to pick me up. The aide knows full well that nobody's coming, to, that there were no arrangements being. And so the aide now concludes that this woman is delusional. So lying, that, that's called treachery. That's what Tom Kitt would call treachery. You, you tell somebody a lie to get them to do something. But the, this is lying about something that's outrageous because, well, well, then what's going to happen when you when she says, well, where's my son? Oh, well, he had it. Now it's going to be another lie, right? Well, he called and said he could, he got a flat tire. I mean, it, it just compounds itself. So there are some situations where that would not be therapeutic to the person. It might be therapeutic for the aide because I got to get dressed. But, you know, but what about that person? What does that lie mean to that person? What are you trying to accomplish here? So, I mean, I would, I would never try to make a, a huge statement about there are some little things that really don't matter. I mean, it, nobody cares. That's a big one, though. And that's something you don't lie about. Yeah. I hope that's helpful. No, no, that was a really good answer. Um, the, this other question, I think it's kind of in the same vein. If you agree something with someone living with dementia, they, they're, they're saying that some people think you don't need to follow through as they won't remember. But they have an issue with this and they feel that as a carer, you should follow through and build on trusting communication. Yes. Oh, of course. The th this is one of the biggest mistakes, and that's why I, I made a, I, I kind of alluded to this a few minutes ago when I said, what you say and do will be memorable to that person. I mean, there's this whole business, and I, again, this is one of my hobby horses, if I don't have that expression around the you know, Ireland way, but it's one of my soapboxes. I mean, this business of talking about people who have memory loss, that is so wrong. Well, wait, I don't even know what the hell that means. You lost all of your memories. They're not there anymore. You can't. What is it? Anyway, my point is that people will make new memories. They can. And they can show that they've made the memories. They may not be able to recall what you said, but they can They will remember that you did what you did. So John Killick had a great example of this where he, he uh, would have conversations with people with dementia in care homes, and he would make poems out of what they said. He, he wouldn't do any, he would use their words, but he would just organize them, their words only. He wouldn't add his own and make poems out of it. And so he did this one day with a woman called Peachy 
and he brought this to her and she looked at it she could read and she had to go out into the hallway and have and, and, and read it to people and, and it turns out that uh, he hadn't john hadn't gone back there for two weeks but in the interim the staff had that poem framed for peachy and it was hanging in her room so john comes back to visit with peachy and peachy says look at that and he sees it he knows it's the poem that he gave her and she says read that and he starts reading it, and she's no out loud so he reads it out loud and she says isn't that something he said, yeah that's really good and she said a nice man came here and, and gave that to me she couldn't recall it was john but she made a memory of a nice man who came and gave that to her now, who was that? I don't know. I'm, well, you see, this, so what is memory loss? So you assume that people are going to remember, especially if it's important. If it's important, there's a memory is going to be made. So yeah, I wouldn't be lying about stuff that's important. Very good. Ah, oh, so many glowing comments and, and agreement with what you've said today. So well, thank you so much, Stephen. That was great. Well, my pleasure. I'm, I'm thrilled to be here and and, even at a distance from Dublin, I'm thrilled to be here. <laughs> I really Very am. Good. Well, we wish you were here in person. So yeah. we'll, we'll do that some point in the future, hopefully. That will be a pleasure for, believe me. And thank you very much for everyone to, for, you know, for taking the time to listen. And, and I, I wish you all be safe, be safe, be well, um, do what you need to do to keep safe and, and make other people safe too. That's a great message to end on.